Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here. Thanks again so, so much for joining me. Now, in this video, we're gonna start looking at the next form of social pressure, and that is obedience. And we're gonna be spending the vast majority of this video talking about the infamous Stanley Milgram study of 1963. Now, conformity is one thing, but obedience is something completely uh, sinister, and it is. Uh, there's a huge amount to say about this area of psychology. So let's dive straight in. First thing we have to do is we have to define obedience. Now, obedience goes kind of hand in hand with uh, conformity. So both of these are forms of social pressure. But whereas conformity is a little bit more subtle, it is about observing and doing what the group are doing, often unspoken, obedience is the response to a direct order or instruction. It's not you that's deciding to conform here. You are being told to do something by someone or something. Now, it normally comes from an authority figure. And that authority figure can be a person or it can be a group of people. So, for example, if a policeman comes along, he shows you his badge and he tells you to do something, you're probably going to do it. He is an authority figure. A judge would be an authority figure. Um, we might even say that a celebrity might be an authority figure, someone that you look up to and admire. There are lots of these that they're telling you to do something and ultimately you do it. That is obedience. Now we're going to spend some time looking at the most famous and infamous study in all of obedience psychology and that is the Milgram study of 1963. So, at Yale University, just outside of New York, this man that you can see up here, Stanley Milgram, he's very, very interested in one thing in particular. Given that he himself is Jewish, and also given uh, that his parents had lived through the concentration camps of the Second World War in Germany, he was very interested in figuring out why both German soldiers and the concentration camp guards carried out unspeakably horrible orders. He was fascinated by people like Adolf Eichmann down here. Adolf Eichmann was in charge of Hitler's trains. He ran millions, literally millions of Drew, uh, Jews from um, various places into the concentration camps, responsible for many, many, many deaths. Adolf Eichmann was to say later he was just following orders. So why on earth did he do these things? Did he not feel any remorse? What was going on? These are the things that Milgram was interested in. So what he did was he invented this machine that you can see behind him, which he called the electroshock generator. In reality though, I'll let you into this, it's just a box that lights up. There's nothing sinister about it whatsoever. It's just a box. Now he puts an advert in a paper and he gets 40 American men from the New York and wider area to come to his laboratory at Yale University. The participants are told that they are going to be the teachers in this experiment and they're introduced to uh, a slightly older guy who they uh, know as Mr. Wallace. Now Mr. Wallace of course works for Stanley Milgram. He is a stooge but the participants don't know that. Now the learner is strapped onto this electroshock generator by his hand and the teacher is told you're going to ask this man questions. Now, the point is here that the teacher can't see Mr. Wallace. It's behind uh, a wall. But every time the teacher, sorry, every time the learner gets something wrong, then they're going to give them a shock. They're going to press a button. The teacher is going to press a button on the electroshock generator and it's going to give Mr. Wallace a shock. Now, of course, Mr. Wallace isn't getting harmed at all. He's just a very good actor here. But the teachers, the participants, they don't know that. They think they're legitimately shocking this guy. Up to, and this is amazing, 450 volts. This is labeled danger, XXX, extreme intensity shock at this point. They're basically thinking that they're going to kill this guy. Now, what's uh, interesting about this is that uh, Mr. Wallace is an incredibly good actor. He, of course, starts to make mistakes, but you know, he's been told to. He's working for Milgram after all. The first few shocks, he's grunting with pain. He's screaming out. 
And then he begins to shout to be released. He's saying, God, let me out of here. I, I didn't agree to this. I've got a heart condition. What are you doing to me? This is so painful. Let me out of this. And then after 315 volts, he stops making noise. And of course, through all of this, the participant is being encouraged to go on by the experimenter who's standing next to him. If the participant, the teacher, hesitates and says, what, what happens if he gets hurt in there? Then the researcher, Milgram or someone else says, you have no choice. You must go on. Now, if the participant was to ask three times, then absolutely he would be let away and told the true nature of the experiment. However, less than three times, he had to go on with it. Now, Milgram and his colleagues were quite interested in this. Obviously, they knew they had a really good experiment here. And they were thinking about it. And they're thinking, yeah, maybe it's just something about the German psyche. Maybe they are more likely to follow orders. We reckon that the American people wouldn't just fall for this. They wouldn't uh, go all obedience and, and start doing this just because they were told to. They wouldn't hurt people just because they were told to, would they? They predicted that 3% of participants would go all the way to the end. That was, you know, pretty good. So that's three out of every 100 men are going to go all the way to the end, meaning 97 of them are not going to. What they find, of course, well, remember, this is psychology. Nothing should shock you by now. A massive, pardon the pun, a massive 65% of people obeyed all the way up to the end. Way more than half went all the way to the end. Some people were even disappointed that there wasn't more voltage to do. They were like, can we go up to 475? Can we go up to 500 volts? Many of the participants were a little bit more uncomfortable with this. They showed signs of stress. They were sweating. They were shaking. Nervous laughter, that kind of thing. But incredibly, none of the participants, 100% of participants, went up to 300 volts. None of them stopped before that. And if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. Evaluation-wise, this has got a lot of praise behind it. It is particularly valuable. Number one, because it was the first study done of its kind. And number two, it showed a very unexpected result. This is naive psychology we're doing here, but it's an excellent, excellent result that they've got. Number one criticism here, of course, is ethics. The guys aren't told the true nature of the experiment. They're told it's a, sub, uh, a study into memory, not into obedience. As well as that, think about the psychological, psychiatric harm that this is potentially doing to these guys. These guys think that the teach, the learner sorry, is incredibly damaged through there. They might have even killed them. That's going to have a really big psychological toll on you. Of course, Milgram defends this and he says that on recommendation, 84% of people say they, they were glad to have done it. They were actually quite happy with the whole um, experiment and they actually wanted to do it again or recommend it to their friends. And as well as that, professional psychiatrists came in and evaluated all the guys here. Turns out none of them were long term harmed. So it seems that the guys are absolutely fine and Milgram's got away with it. However, ethics, of course, are going to be our number one evaluation point for Milgram's study. Other studies of obedience we'll just go through very quickly. The first one we'll look at is Hoffling and colleagues 1966. His biggest issue here was that Milgram's experiment was done in the laboratory. How realistic is that in real life? So what he did was concoct a nice little study here where he was going to practice in a real life situation. He phones up a nurse on a night shift and he says, see that drug in the cabinet there. It's called Astro 10. I want you to go down to the end of the hall, go to Mr. Smith's bed and give him twice the recommended dose. Don't worry, I'm a doctor. And he puts the phone down. Now, twice the lethal dose is going to kill that person in that bed. But incredibly, 21 out of 22 nurses obeyed Hoffling. They didn't ask who he was. They just took it on recommendation that he was in fact a doctor and were ready to kill a defenseless patient. Another little study done here, it's slightly more sinister, this one. Yeah, we're fine with people getting killed, but puppies, oh no, leave the puppies alone. Sheridan and King in the 1970s, they did Milgram's experiment. However, this time they used real electricity, much lower voltage, harmless ultimately, but still quite painful. And instead of using people, they used tiny little puppy dogs. Oh, how sad. Now, the dogs were yelping and they were howling with pain and all sorts of horrible things. But despite this, three quarters of participants went all the way to the end. 
this is usually the study that most people think is absolutely appalling. And they think, I would never do the same thing. Fact is, three out of four people would do, which is absolutely incredible. Key concepts here, guys, we're talking everything about these studies. So Milgram's obviously our big one, 1963. We'll talk about him more later on. Hoffling and colleagues, 1966, he with the nurses, and then Sheridan and King with the puppy dogs. All of these things tell us one thing. Obedience exists. More people than you would think obey, and this can lead to some very, very nasty repercussions. Cheers, guys. That's everything for today. We're going to come back in the next video, and we're going to look at the factors surrounding obedience. But until then, thanks so, so much for watching, and we'll see you again next time. Cheers.